this is our second webinar series that we've been doing as a joint effort in our um, process of updating the NESCO One community plan. And tonight's session is really important because um, there's a strong relationship between development and emergency preparedness. And in a land use role, what we do uh, for emergency preparedness is we make sure that the right provisions are in place through our implementing ordinances or the zoning regulations that apply to your community to reduce risk and to mitigate for hazards that we all know that our experts are with us today to talk about. And so as we go through this conversation this evening, um, one of the things to keep in mind as we move forward with um, updating the NESCO and community plan is to think about, are we adequately mitigating for these hazards that we're going to talk about tonight? Um, because there may be an opportunity moving forward, either through proposed ordinance regulation amendments or through stronger policies that you would like to implement through your community plan to better address hazard mitigation and risk reduction when it comes to future development in your community. Sarah, I'm really sorry. I have to interrupt you because I forgot something. No, please go ahead. Okay, I'm really, really sorry. You know, this is just the second one. We need to start recording this. And I forgot to tell Chris to start recording. And I already started recording. Okay, so then there we need go. to tell everyone that you're being recorded. All mm -hmm. right, so everyone from this point forward, it's being recorded. Thank you very much. I sincerely mm -hmm. apologize, but now y'all know. Thank you. Back to Sarah. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. So, um, just to introduce our panelists this evening, um, people that I thoroughly enjoy working with and are so excited that are going to be joining us to share information with us this evening are David Helmrichs from the Department of Forestry, uh, Tillamook County Sheriff Jim Horton, Marge Josa, who is the coordinator uh, for the South uh, Tillamook County Emergency Volunteer Corps, Lieutenant Gordon McGraw, who is our Tillamook County Manage uh, Emergency Management Director, uh, Fire Chief Jim Ader, who uh, is the Fire Chief for the Nestucca Rural Fire Protection District, Aaron Scar, who is County Commissioner-Elect and uh, Care Executive Director, Joanna Stelzig from Tillamook PUD, Public Relations Manager, and last but certainly not least, County Commissioner David Yamamoto. Okay, so David, you are first on the list, and Brenda, thank you for putting these in alphabetical order. I almost panicked because I thought I was going to have to do some quick adjustments here real quick. Uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you. So can everybody hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, so my name is David Helmerks. I'm with the Oregon Department of Forestry. I'm the permanent forest officer here in the Tillamook District, uh, which we cover all the way down to uh, basically the Tillamook County line. Um, my <clears throat> main role during the summer is fire protection. Um, so any firefighters you see out on the fire lines during wildland fire season, I'm possibly one of them. Um, but some other stuff I do also is uh, my main thing is uh, what's called firewise, uh, basically make sure your home is uh, prepared and defendable from wildfires. Um, it's a program that's national wide uh, through NFPA, National Fire Protection Association. Um, they have standards that you can actually set um, where a community can uh, become nationally recognized um, as a firewise community. Um, and it also shows that we've got one. Right now we have no uh, identified firewise committees in Selma County. Um, I'm working with Brenda Freshman on one up where she lives. Um, but it's, you can still take the principles that if you're not even uh, firewise recognized and still take the principles to your own home um, and implement those principles. Um, I've gone around to several homes in the, the district and the county um, and walked around with people and kind of pointed out what things to, to do. Um, we look at the house themselves and then we work from the base of the chimney and working down out um, into the landscape. Um, defensible space is a, is a key thing. Uh, as you probably have seen with all the fires that we've had um, in the, around the state and still around the county or country, um, a lot of homes are being burned down and it's not just by the flame front. Um, a lot of the homes are being burned down by the embers. 
Um, so a lot of the embers are landing in little nooks and crannies and crevices around your home, um, on decks and gutters, on roofs, um, even your attic vents. And that's what's causing the house to catch fire and burn down. Um, so walking around, uh, doing a house visit or a site visit, um, I can walk around and kind of point out things to work on kind of over time. Um, some recommendations are expensive. Um, for instance, some houses have still aluminum frame, single pane windows. Recommendation is going to a double pane window, but I know and understand as a homeowner as well, that may not be the most feasible and uh, accessible thing to do right away. Um, we locally had a fire ourselves, um, the Pike Road fires, most of you probably have heard about. Um, also for most of you down in Nesquin area, you also were dealing with uh, the Echo Mountain Complex. Um, that even burned into our district as well, um, but we were focused on the one up on Pike Road. Um, a lot of those homes burned down because they were in tight communities. Um, some of them didn't have some of those uh, firewise principles uh, set in place. Um, but it's something that always can be thinking about and looking at. Um, another program that I kind of haven't done a whole lot with um, is what's called fire adapted communities. It's more uh, something with uh, more of a larger community wise, uh, for instance, than for Nesquin would be a good uh, example. Um, and it's something that's not just focused on uh, fire. It can be also some of the principles can be implemented on um, and used for tsunamis, uh, flooding, other uh, natural disasters as well. So um, those are kind of two big programs I deal with. I do all the fire prevention activities also for the district. Um, so if you guys go to fairs, home garden shows, anything like that, and you see an Oregon Department of Forestry, um, that's probably me or someone that's going to be working kind of with me um, there. So. Um, I'm up for questions towards the end when we get to that point. Um, I know there's going to be a lot, uh, especially after the local fires going on. So that's all I have right now. Back to you, sir. Thank you, David. Sheriff Horton. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? There's some nodding. So I guess we're good to go. Well, hey, thank you for having me tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with everyone. Um, so I'm Sheriff Jim Horton. Um, I've been with the Sheriff's Office for 23 years and I've been uh, Sheriff for the last uh, about 15 months. And, uh, you know, it's a, a real privilege to work with many of you. And um, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a, a great, great partnership with a lot of the agencies um, that, that we, we have contact with. Um, so our responsibility, as you know, we maintain a 96 bed correctional facility. We uh, have the community corrections program, which is commonly referred to as parole and probation. Um, you see most of our, our deputies in, in the criminal division, which is responsible for um, general investigations, uh, response to criminal calls for service, um, um, emergency response and search and rescue operations, things of that nature. So that's where, where most of you in South County see us. As you all know, there's not an incorporated community um, south of Tillamook. So we are the only law enforcement agency that, that responds to, to events and calls for service in South County. Uh, we have 23 members of our criminal division. Uh, there are about 13 on general patrol. The rest are what we call contract positions, which are, um, we have a number of uh, cooperative patrol agreements with the Oregon Department of Forestry, U.S. Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management. Um, so those deputies are, are tasked to certain specific areas within the county, like the Sayusla National Forest. Um, so it may look like we have a lot of people on patrol, but uh, in reality, on a fully staffed day, we have three deputies taking criminal calls for service. That would be one central around the Tillamook area, one in North County, and that is from uh, Falcon Cove, to Central Tillamook, and the South County Deputy is responsible from Central Tillamook, Third Street, all the way to Cascade Head. So it's, it's a huge area for three deputies to, to respond to. In the wintertime, it's somewhat manageable when, when the visitor pattern and, and the numbers of people in the county are down, 
But uh, in, in the summertime, it's quite challenging. Our deputies are going from call to call to call all day long for the 24 hour, for the, for the 10 hour shift. Um, what some of you may or may not know is that we do not have 24 hour patrol coverage um, currently in the county. There's only one agency that has a 24 hour patrol coverage model and that's the city of Tillamook. And from 2 a.m. until 7 a.m., um, well actually 3 a.m. until 7 a.m., um, there's, there's one officer on duty and that's the Tillamook PD officer. So from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m., we have an on-call structure and if there's an emergency or a call that rises to a, a certain level, certain criteria, we would call a deputy out to respond. But during those hours, unfortunately, there's, there's no one on duty, which is something we, we believe that we need to change. And we've been talking about that for a number of years and it, and it, it really is time for the sheriff's office to have a 24 hour uh, patrol coverage model in place. Um, you know, we have roughly 27,000 full-time citizens here in the county. That number, it, it's estimated that it swells to about 100,000 in the, in the busy summer months um, at the height of the season. And I think that's probably a, a low estimate given the, the number of calls we have, um, the number of, of emergencies we, re, we respond to. Um, it, it's a very, very busy county. And uh, um, I say this a lot, I, I don't think we're equipped to, to deal with the number of people that, that are pouring into our community to visit. Um, somebody forgot to tell everybody there's a pandemic going on and uh, also that they need to stay home. <laughs> so, um, somewhere along the line, they said, come visit Tillamook County because it seems like we've had the lion's share of visitors here over the summer. And uh, our, our call for service level has been through the roof. Um, many of you, I, I've talked to many of you, I'm sure about the, the ongoing parking problems in South County um, around the Cape Kiwanda Woods area. Um, and certainly issues that go, go, go on in the, the Nesquan community. Um, you know, Gordon will talk about the, the states of emergency that we've had in the county in 2020. Um, so I'll, I won't steal his thunder, but it's kept our office very, very busy. Um, we have about 52 members in our, in our sheriff's office. Um, recently, the juvenile department was also placed under the wing of the sheriff's office. So we, we have a lot of responsibility from emergency response to, to supervision of adult and juvenile offenders and, and to our correctional facilities. So um, we do a lot um, with, with very little. Um, one of the things that, that we do and we're mandated to do is search and rescue operations. And, and that falls in the sheriff's office in all 36 counties across the state of Oregon. Um, almost every one of our search and rescue operations involves someone who does not live in Tillamook County it's a visitor, it's, a, it's, a, it's hunters during hunting season. People that live here typically don't need the search and rescue services because they, they know how to prepare, they, they know what to do, they know um, the, the terrain, they live here. It's, it's the visitors that really are impacting um, a number of, of services and, and our response, frankly. Um, some of the ways that we're, uh, we're, we're trying to explore additional coverage and, and resources is through the, uh, the Cape Kwanda Master Parking Plan. And I'm sure Commissioner Yamamoto will, will talk about that a little bit, but uh, there, there are projections that that has the ability to raise quite a bit of money. Um, we, we would be able to, I'm, I'm being waved there, um, would be able to raise some additional funds to, to fund additional officers for South County. And that would be NESCO and um, Cape Kwanda Pacific City area. They would be general law enforcement um, resources um, with an emphasis on parking management and control. So um, we do a lot of things. Uh, I know I, you know, pushed a lot of information into just a few minutes, but uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions for anybody um, and uh, tell you more about our office. It's a wonderful group of people and, and I'm, I'm very proud of what we've done over the last several years. So I think I'll wrap it up with that. Thank you, Sheriff. Marge Josa. Good evening, everyone. And I'm gonna work really hard at not yawning since I am on the East Coast. And it's, uh, I don't even know what time it is here, way after nine o'clock. So um, I am Marge Josa. I'm president of the board of directors of the South Tillamook County Emergency Volunteer Corps. Uh, the Emergency Volunteer Corps has been around for several years, but at the beginning of 2020, we incorporated and became a 501c3 organization. 
For Nascawin, our priorities have been, as most of you know, the tsunami signage um, project under Gene Cameron's lead. And we're winding up that project and you should be seeing signs starting to pop up in various neighborhoods and in the village. Um, we're also exploring funding for um, emergency sheds to go at the assembly areas. Uh, the folks on the crest have taken the lead in that project and are exploring uh, building sheds in partnership with our friends at Cape Mears. We don't have to reinvent that wheel and looking for funding to put the first shed near the water tower on the crest because that's one of the assembly areas. We're also um, growing our network of GMRS radios and hams throughout South County, but also in Neskowin and have a network that by relay can get from one end of the county um, all the way up to Beaver through relay out to uh, Tierra Del Mar and up Slab Creek. So we're very proud of that network. In addition, we're looking to increase our certs. COVID certainly has thrown a little stressful piece there in terms of figuring out training, but FEMA recently has approved online training for CERT. So we will be launching online training after the first of the year. We also um, are, are working with uh, our friends up in North County, in Manzanita on a WASH program, water sanitation and hygiene, and figuring out how to deliver training into South County. And then also we're looking to increase the neighborhood captains. And I'm, I'll get back to that in a second. One of the things about the EBC is that when a disaster strikes, we just don't nod and smile and say, well, things worked really well. And so the Echo Mountain Otis fire occurred and I heard from a lot of people in Nesquim Pacific City, Tierra Del Mar about their frustrations with emergency response. So what we did recently, um, several members, myself and two other members of the EBC met with Gordon McCraw and Brian Jones from the fire district and Commissioner Mary Faith Bell to discuss where we go now. What did we learn from our drill, if you will? Luckily for Nascawin, it was a drill um, and not a disaster. What did we learn? Where do, what, what are the next steps? Where do we go from here? And we came to, after a great discussion and everybody being honest about what worked and what didn't work and the challenges we face going forward, we came to an agreement that our priority is going to be to improve our emergency communications network, to really work out the fine details and figure out how we get a word from incident command and the fire district out to the residents in South County. The second part of that, and um, <clears throat> David will be hearing from us, is to prioritize FireWise and other fire prevention programs in South County. And we'll be working with the fire district uh, to roll out those programs during the winter and the spring and really visiting the communities and making some assessments and, and working with David on what can we do to improve our situation. So if a fire did occur in South County, Nesquim, Pacific City, et cetera, that we would be prepared and we would be in much better shape than quite frankly we are today. We, uh, we also agreed that we would focus on more on public education and really get folks better prepared for any disaster. Um, it's interesting that we, we heard from communities that really weren't involved in emergency preparedness and now um, really want to get some information and really take a look at what they can do in their neighborhoods. And that brings me back to the neighborhood captains. We are going to be really pushing for more neighborhood captains throughout South County so that the neighborhood captains can, we can really help them create their own network of communication so that they can pass information from one to another and, and how to do it. And that was part of our discussion with Gordon and Brian was how do we get the communication out? Where do we, uh, you know, we don't wanna just do hearsay because there was a lot of misinformation as many of you know that was going around in South County during that Otis fire. So what are the correct channels and how do we publicize and teach our residents what those correct channels are? The EVC will continue to work on preparedness. Um, you know, we're, we're, we carry the banner and more and more people uh, 
are joining us and we want everyone to join us in this work. Um, the more we're prepared, the better we can handle the disaster. And after the disaster, the better we can have those discussions and be honest with one another about what worked and what didn't work. There is a question that I want to throw out and maybe Sarah, we could just put this on a back burner or Brenda. And that is when it comes to tsunamis and evacuations and land use, I think one of the things our community needs to discuss is whether we are willing to look at and take on vertical evacuation structures and where that might be worth it. Um, and this is not something that, oh, let's decide tomorrow and then it, ha it happens next March. But it's, it's a long haul, but really to take a look at that option. And also, do we have the appropriate evacuation routes in all our neighborhoods? Or are there some zoning or code barriers that are preventing us from having better evacuation routes? So I too am open to questions at the end of this. Thank you. Thank you, Marge. And that's certainly something, so the answer to all of that is yes, that has been part of our planning process and we can definitely um, dive into that more later if there's time or another time after tonight. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Gordon McGraw. If you know me, limiting me to five minutes just doesn't work. Anyway, so yeah, as uh, Sheriff Horton said, it's been a very busy year. It started with a uh, winter storm back in December that I had to activate for. Um, then the, the tornado belt of the West Coast, Manzanita, had another tornado. So that's their second one. Then it was followed by flooding in town from another storm that we had come in. And then you may recall that the county itself had a cyber attack that kind of disabled things and then made things a little tough for about three months. Um, I closed that item in March and that same day we opened up the incident command for COVID response, which I've been working on. And then just for fun and games, they threw in a fire that uh, I think has filled up my bingo card. So uh, now I'm back on to COVID and I can tell you we have 70 cases uh, 59 positives and 11 presumptive. Um, that's what we've been at for a few days now. Um, I, yeah, I'm the emergency management director, your weather dude, the uh, lieutenant on the command staff, and as I like to put it, all of the duties as assigned. Um, and there has been a few this year. So the thing that is probably most prevalent right now of interest to you guys and a lot of other people are the fires that we had, the Pike Street fire, which um, was that way about a mile from my house, uh, burned 301 acres. Uh, they lost a shed. And the, the reason we lost a shed is I talked to the gentleman and went up there and looked. It, he, he had bought something like 12, 14 acres. I don't remember exactly. And to maintain it, he bought a bunch of equipment. Then he decided he needed to put the equipment in something. So he built a garage on top of the hill and that's what we lost thanks to some outstanding efforts by ODF, the local fire districts, uh, the South Fork crew um, in the logging, volunteer logging people that went up and helped develop the line around the fire and that's why I think we were so successful in only losing that. So I'm crediting all those folks with uh, the reason we have such low numbers. Um, just to give you an idea, of course, we I got the call, I think it was what, Labor Day, about 11 o'clock at night to come in and, and help. Uh, there was a fire and I'm like, okay, well, how do I have to go to a fire? And then I went in there and saw that 911 was getting calls at the rate of about uh, 120 calls an hour, which is pretty darn busy for those guys when you consider uh, that's two a minute and it takes longer than a minute to get rid of who else, whoever's on the line. So they were really busy. Um, the, some of the, the problems that we had, of course, is multiple fires going on. As fast as we put one out, another one would develop. The Pike Street fire kept growing. Then we started hearing about Lincoln County and the, the uh, Echo Mountain fire. And of course, the problem that we had is information coming from Lincoln County was pretty darn sparse. I, made several calls down south to try to get information and they said they'd call me back and about four hours later they would. As you can imagine in that four hours 
room of control had taken over and um, I heard that postal workers were going around telling everybody that uh, in Tillamook County that they needed to evacuate. Um, there was just rumor after rumor after rumor and the reality was everything was fortunately for us south of Tillamook County's line. Um, but again, getting the information uh, was not nearly as easy for the Pike Street, I mean, the Echo Fire than as, a, as it was for the Pike Street Fire. Um, kudos, um, she's on here, Joanna, um, with PUD, they, we had a representative in 911 with us and they were doing just phenomenal work with, uh, as information would come in about a line down or trees on a line, it would go straight to them and they'd get straight on it. Then the fire people would need to de-energize some lines and it, it occurred just quickly. And that's what helped everybody do what they needed to do. Um, information for us wound up being on the um, Sheriff's Office Facebook page because we had the, our guy that handles that right there in 911 with us. So he was pumping it out. They put a link on uh, the share, I mean, on Tillamook County's webpage to that page so that you could keep up with the up to date information that he was pumping out. I also gave him my Nixle uh, passwords and everything so that he could push the information out on Nixle as well. Um, one of the, I don't know how much time I got left because this is a big one. Um, one of the your time's the actually problems. up but you, why don't you take another minute all right okay. one of the big <laughs> problems we had are the homes in uh what is it cascade ranch that are in tillamook county but you have to go into lincoln county to get there um and when they put the evacuation notice up um they did it and it only registered for lincoln county although that portion of Tillamook County should have been included also. Um, but they never told us in Tillamook County, the, their 911 folks and our 911 folks didn't talk. Um, and that's a problem that we have addressed with Tillamook, I mean, with uh, Lincoln County, their dispatch is actually out of Salem. So that adds another element to it. Um, and we've also discussed it with Everbridge, who is the company that does the alerting for both us and Lincoln County. And we're pushing our zones out a half a mile on each side so that if you happen to be in the Lincoln County area um, or Tillamook County, but it's in Lincoln County, um, so to speak, you'll get notified, but you would have to register on both sites which means you might get notified twice, but twice is better than none at all. And with that, I'll stop until the end. Thank you, Gordon. Chief Ader. Is Chief Ader with us? Thought I saw him on here earlier. Um, no, do we see, Brenda, do you see Chief Ader on there? Um, I don't. So maybe he had to, you know, sometimes there's technical challenges. So why don't we go to the next on the list? Um, okay. and then if he comes back in, sure. Uh, we'll, invite him. we'll check, okay. we'll check again before we conclude. Okay. Excellent. Commissioner elect Aaron Scar. Well, good evening. Um, thank you for inviting me to join you tonight. My role in emergency response has up to this point been as the executive director of CARE, and CARE is your local anti-poverty agency. And we get involved in emergency response really in two ways, largely. Uh, one is with our warming center. So when we have dangerous weather that's going on in our community, we do open a warming center in Tillamook uh, for those who are experiencing homeless, or it's also been for folks if they lose their power, that kind of thing, and we have a, a space they can come to. 
Um, the other place really has been in response following different emergencies. Most commonly, it's been the floods and in Telemec, where folks are then displaced from their home or experience um, losses in their home that are low income, they'll, they'll come to care for assistance. So that's been kind of my role up to this point. Um, the other role that I've taken in emergency response has been around facilitation of planning processes. So I got involved with the TC4 group in about 2013 and was a participant. We were just, you know, there making sure that I was living and learning. Um, and then in 2018, Linda Kozlowski tapped myself and Ms. Carlson Swanson from the Oregon Food Bank to bring together a process to sort of look at how prepared is Tillamook County. And we worked with the amazing groups of volunteers that had been coming to TC4 to really evaluate the complete county um, and, and how prepared were we in a variety of different areas. So um, what came out of that was actually a whole new group was born around central Tillamook County and the agencies that are responding to emergencies in central Tillamook County because it became clear that there were sort of two different uh, groups that are responding and you guys have an amazing emergency volunteer corps in South County that actually it's been really fun to watch that grow when I started in TC4 in 2013 um, there was just really this awareness coming that you all didn't have your own group and you really wanted to do that and boy it has just exploded you guys have done amazing work uh, but what became clear in in the facilitation process that we did in 1819 was that there are volunteer groups in many of our communities that are doing fabulous work. Um, but there was not a, a volunteer group in Central County. And then the other thing that really became clear is that many of our agencies that are involved in emergency response were not really talking with one another. Great example of that was everyone, they said, well, where's your, your evacuation points in Central County? Everybody said the fairgrounds. And the fairgrounds said, I didn't know that. So there was this need to really begin to get together as agencies and see how are we preparing. So that group was formed and I continue to be a part of that group. So with that, I will turn over my time. I am a commissioner elect, but I am not yet up to speed on all of the roles of the county. So I will be looking forward to hearing from Commissioner Yamamoto as to um, where those roles are. So thank you. Thank you, Erin. Joanna Stelzeg, and I see you brought Chris Oftemar also from PUD. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so I'm Joanna Stelzeg. I am the Public Relations Manager at Tillamook PUD. For those of you that don't know, Tillamook PUD is your local electric utility. Um, we provide our role in the community. Um, our main priority is to provide safe and reliable electricity um, to our customers. We have about 21,000 customers that we serve. We serve the entire Tillamook County, um, which is about a little over 1,100 square miles. So it's quite a bit of service territory. Um, we respond to a variety of situations, emergencies, and of course, a little bit differently depending on the emergencies. Some of our everyday things that can occur, um, anything from a vehicle accident, motor vehicle accident into a pole or um, some windstorm um, response. Um, we have crews that um, are highly trained throughout the whole service territory to respond, assess damage and make repairs. Um, we have a serviceman that is stationed in your area. We have a North County, a South County and a Central County serviceman. So we have somebody that's localized um, there that does primarily um, the work, the day-to-day -day work, patrolling and um, preventative maintenance. Um, it's beneficial for us to have somebody in those areas so that um, they, they know the area really well and they can, um, they work there every day and they can kind of keep up on, on what needs to be done. Um, you've probably seen him around a lot. Bobby Lightfoot is the South uh, Tillamook County serviceman. So um, we have a rigorous maintenance system that we go through um, and our tree crew does as well um, to try to keep up on all of that. And um, for us, this work is crucial for preparedness to keep up on system maintenance. And I will pass the football to Chris and he can kind of give a little overview on um, our response um, from the September windstorm in your area. So take it away, Chris.
can't hear you. Oh no. I could try and lip read. <laughs> Did they unmute? Did you unmute unmute Chris? Yeah, he's he's not muted. Hmm. Now he's Chris, muted. Chris, is your speaker on your laptop muted or turned down? Um, well, maybe I can uh, work with Chris on getting that. What you could do is there's a cell phone number he could call in on his cell phone. I did that another, you know, then he could do the vocal on his cell phone and we see the video. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, oh, there we go. Oh, there he is. Oh, okay. okay, now we can hear you. So you fixed it. I didn't actually change anything. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, I'm Chris Oftenmeyer from, uh, I'm the operations manager at Tillamook UD. Um, I just wanted to give a brief overview. I know we're about out of time probably. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, so even though this storm started Monday, we actually started uh, early into the weekend identifying, um, as we got weather alerts, identifying our highest risk areas uh, for this typical storm. Or this, uh, storm. Uh, one of the things we realized is that with the east winds coming out of the canyons into the valley, um, that the winds would be strongest in the canyons themselves. So we actually identified and put on one shot, uh, which means it's a more sensitive setting for the power lines. Um, and we identified anything east of 101 out, outside of the valley up the canyons um, east of 101 was the highest risk areas in, in the actual valleys themselves. And we put those on one shot. And so they wouldn't try to close back in to re-energize the customers. Um, another thing that we did is uh, we didn't re-energize while the, the actual storm was still going, which was kind of non-typical for us. Usually we make repairs and then re-energize to get the customers back on. This time with the fire risk and the high winds, we actually left the power off until the wind stopped for a little bit longer than what we would have normally done. Um, another thing that we did is 100% patrols on our line. Um, and what that entails is we didn't want to close in on anything, you know, and have any, any uh, fire dangers. And so we actually, after we made repairs, we had to go and, and visually inspect 100% of our lines before we closed in. Um, much like everybody else, uh, we had limited resources for this type of event. Um, so we actually ran our crew structures a little bit different um, and broke down into two journeyman work groups with a lot of ground support so that we could be in many uh, locations all spread out throughout the county and still continue to do our work. Um, we used the ICS, the Incident Command System, again, uh, this storm. We, that has proven to be very effective um, for us. We set it up a little bit different this time and we continued to adapt to it because of the storm. Um, normally how we have it structured, um, we have key people that usually are in key positions. Uh, this time we rotated that around so that I could be out in the field instead of in the office, you know, organizing the crews and stuff. Um, made a lot of good uh, connections in the community. And one thing I want to say, I know we're out of time. Um, <clears throat> with this event, with limited resources, which I know everybody had, I mean, everybody had, and to see everybody come together in this communicate, uh, community and work together the way they did, I tell you what, it was second to none that I've ever seen. Uh, phenomenal job from everybody. And uh, it was a great learning experience. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris and Joanna. County Commissioner David Yamamoto. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, this evening. Um, you, can't, you can't talk about emergency management unless you talk about the EBC, Emergency Volunteer Corps of Nahalem Bay. And I was involved with, with uh, e e EBCNB for many, many years, since I was chair of the Futures Council, gosh, 13, 14, 15 years ago. Uh, that sort of transition to TC4, the Tillamook County Citizens Corps Council, uh, which Aaron talked about earlier. Uh, the great thing about uh, EBCNB is that they do want to share. It's their philosophy, why reinvent the wheel? Uh, they've already 
They've been in existence for some 20 years and have developed such amazing systems and they are absolutely willing to share. And so I appreciate that so much. Uh, I especially for the South Tillamook County Emergency Volunteer Corps, I just have to do a shout out to Marge Joseph. Marge, you're doing just a terrific job. Uh, you're not doing this alone. Uh, I've got to give a shout out to Misty Horton. Um, she has taken it up with the school kids at Mustaka Valley School District. And she found that If you involve the children at school, that's just a great thing. Uh, one more, you have been doing just a terrific job. Uh, you really have, and I, I do appreciate that so much. Uh, I, I really do. Um, so we have been busy. Um, as Gordon mentioned, we had the hazmat situation earlier, the ransomware attack on the county, COVID-19. As a commissioner, I was always extremely busy, uh, but this last March when COVID hit, it seems like it's stumping two or three additional jobs on top of what I'm doing. So Aaron, this is what you have to look forward to, although I know you already understand that. Uh, and then of course we had the fire. Although the COVID situation brought on an, an, uh, another situation that we hadn't planned on, uh, and that was a record number of visitors to Tillamook County. Uh, people were staying at home, rightfully so, uh, but when the weather started to turn warm in the valley, guess what? They wanted to go somewhere. Guess where they came? They came to the beach in record numbers. And so uh, Sheriff Horton, uh, I, again, I appreciate everything that you did to keep, keep things safe in Tillamook County. Uh, it's something that we are probably going to be looking at next summer also. So we just need to be prepared for that. Uh, the Tuesday morning uh, after Labor Day, yes. So we had the Pike Road fire. Uh, I found myself at 8 a.m. Up, up above Bay City, uh, looking at the fire, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, ODF, would, and I guess, so, so David, I just have to say, uh, if you have anybody fighting forest fires, you want the Oregon Department of Forestry. There is no better organization fighting forest fires than ODF. So David, again, to you and, and to ODF, many thanks. And you put your lives on the line. Uh, ODF wanted to call in extra crews for our, our Pike Road fire. There were none available. They wanted to call in water drops uh, for the Pike Road fire. No aircraft available. Um, so it was up to um, the, the small ODF crew that they had along with all the local fire districts that fought that fire heroically. And they did a terrific job on it, uh, but that was not without some help. Our local timber industry got involved by bringing tons of heavy equipment in uh, to build fire lines. Uh, we could not have done that without, without the timber industry getting involved. And that's another area that, um, you know, that everyone, if you, well, I'm not sure how many of you were around in, in the 1930s or 40s, um, but we had the big burn. And that fire had the potential of burning up over the Cascade Range, just like the big burn. I think we were extremely fortunate to put it out. Then we had the Echo Complex fire. And I was working very closely with uh, Commissioner Katie Jacobson out of Lincoln County. Uh, there were huge issues there, evacuation of Lincoln, the vast majority of Lincoln City. Um, at the time that they started the evacuation of Lincoln City, Highway 101 South out of Lincoln City was closed. Highway 18 out of Lincoln City going east was closed. Uh, evacuees had one route and that was north on 101. So we were anticipating huge numbers of evacuees. Fortunately, we didn't get them. Uh, we, had, we had quite a few people at our fairgrounds. Uh, Misty Horton was willing to open up every building that she had in South County uh, to, to house evacuees. Uh, but we're again, extremely fortunate that, that we didn't, didn't have to go there. Um, Marge Joseph mentioned radios and communications is a huge issue in Tillamook County. Uh, come to find out when I first became commissioner that Tillamook County was responsible for most of the radio systems in Tillamook County. That includes not only the sheriff's office, but the fire departments and the police departments. Uh, many of your um, um, utility workers, uh, everyone required, uh, ODF relies on our radios. 
Um, Oregon State Patrol relies on our radios. It's an old analog system, and it is about at the end of its useful life. Uh, we are in the process of trying to figure out how we build a new system. Uh, so we brought everyone to the table, all the users are at the table, the ham radio offers, operators are at the table. And we've been working on this now for a year and a half, almost two years. Uh, we're making great progress. At the same time, this radio system is not going to be inexpensive. So we have to be ready for that also. Uh, one other thing I'd like to talk about, uh, everyone knows, and I've been working with Sheriff Horton for a lot of years, uh, Andy Long before that, uh, in strengthening the Tillamook County Sheriff's Office. They are beyond short staff, they really are. Um, so we're very fortunate at this point in time, uh, the Sheriff's Office is almost at full staffing. We're very close to full staffing, probably the closest we've been in many, many years, but we know that that's not enough. Um, so that's why um, Rachel Haggerty at the county and I have been working on uh, ways to raise funds. We would love to use transient lodging tax dollars, uh, but we cannot use transient lodging tax dollars for public safety. So uh, it, just, it just sort of evolved with the overcrowding in South Tillamook County by, by visitors. Uh, we, we came up with a plan to increase our parking fees. And it, we came to find that uh, we could actually fund an additional two or three sheriff's deputies uh, if we increase our parking fees. And we have complete control over how we spend parking fees. So our plan is, and so the, the county commissioners two weeks ago approved the increase in parking fees. And we were just talking about South County initially, uh, but now we've rolled, we, we found that our, our fees throughout the county were really, really low, uh, not, not up to today's standard. So we increased fees throughout the county. Uh, the parks department is going to benefit greatly. Uh, outside of South County, um, but most of the parking fees that we're going to be, be be collecting in South County, uh, we have promised Sheriff Horton that, that we are going to hire a minimum two additional sheriff's deputies. Uh, it's my hope that they will be stationed in South County, live in South County, uh, and most of their duties will be performed in South County. We need enforcement. We need sheriffs on the road. Uh, sheriff Horton has said that with an additional couple of sheriffs, we can, we can look at 24-7 patrols in Tillamook County, which we have not had for a long time. Uh, so it, it's past time that we did that. Um, we're very close to pulling the trigger. As a matter of fact, I've been talking to Jim recently, and I think we're going to hire the first deputy, uh, first a new deputy soon, uh, because... Once you hire them, they've got to go through training and all these, all this testing and background checks. And it, it's a year before they are fully functional and able to be out on their own. So that's something that we're going to start now, even though we're not going to start to collect the parking fees until January 1. Uh, but then shortly after the first of the year, if we have that going, I think we're going to um, hire the second deputy. Uh, so I think we've got some good things in place. Um, I think we all know that it, during the summer months, uh, we are inundated with people and we need help. So that's kind of the direction we're going there. And I can tell my time is probably way <laughs> over. So thank you very much. There's something yeah. to be said about cutting off your boss. You don't want to, <laughs> you want to wait for them to finish. <laughs> uh, so Chief Ader is actually uh, making his way to join us um, as this has been going on. So Brenda, yes, I'd say if you'd like to jump into the Q&A when yeah. we know that Chief Ader is on, then we can certainly um, jump back to him. That's great. So thank you. Thank you, panelists. And now I'm going to ask our hosts, um, now's the time for you to post your questions to the chat. So you post it and you make sure it goes to everyone. And that way, Ran and Chris can see your questions. I think a few questions have already been posted. And so they're going to take turns. Chris will ask a question, then Ran will ask a question. So um, I, I will ask that you keep your microphones on your 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 um, microphones on mute, 
Chris, you might, thank you. Because only Chris and Rand will be speaking with the panelists. That way we can keep it organized. But please, I can't reiterate, post your questions to the chat box because even if we don't get to them, we'll be able to get to them later. Mm -hmm. So um, Chris, are you ready with the first question? Well, before we do that, uh, I saw a note that Jim Oder yes. is online. So maybe oh, great. Uh, see if he's available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay, but so we'll do this. Uh, he'll have his five minutes. Jim, you have five minutes. Sarah, we'll let you moderate that, then give it back to Chris. Or you can ask the first question, actually. Sarah, you had the first question. Sorry, Chris. Sarah has a question. Back to you, Sarah. Oh, uh, thank you. I actually do not have a question. And I, Brenda, I apologize. I cannot see the questions. Oh, so, okay, um, then don't worry about it. No, you don't need to see the questions. So it is Jim, um, why don't you just invite Jim on and then we'll give, then Chris will ask the first question when Jim's done. All right. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. So Chief Ader, welcome to our session this evening. We're so glad you could make it. Uh, so you have the floor for five minutes if you'd like to talk about the fire department's role in emergency preparedness in South County. Good evening. I apologize for being late. It's been a rough day today's and I just forgot about the meeting when I got out of there. Um, so a lot of what we um, we'll be working on even prepping is um, how, do, how do we improve some of the communications that we found, um, the fire um, that we had both in Tillamook and, and North Lincoln kind of brought to light some of those issues. And I um, had my division chief, he actually sat in on the last meeting with all of the South County so that's one of the areas that we will be looking at to improve that. Um, but overall, we're just preparing our end of it. We're preparing for winter, um, not knowing what to expect, but we, we think that um, we'll be able to be a little more prepared than what we were. We're going to take those lessons learned and build from that and make sure that all of our people in South County know th what's going on, where we have issues, and what's one of the big things that we want to try to work on is the false information that we kept hearing about from the fire side. Um, so we want to be able to stop those and make, make our citizens feel a lot more comfortable if we do have another emergency like we had. Um, I'd be open for questions. I mean, that's that's really our big plans for the upcoming, um, if we can get slowed down and be able to get some of these started. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Hey, Jen. Jen, Jen, there's a question for you that came through. Um, it was from, it's from Kay Wyatt. She said that they got most of their information from Lincoln County. We live one mile north of the county line between the 9th and the 11th. Their evacuation maps showed the level two area all the way to the county line. But since we were blocked on both ends of Slab Creek Road, we were extremely alarmed. Why did we not receive any information from the county on this fire for South, uh, from South Tillamook? Uh, no Nixle alerts, uh, no reverse 911 calls uh, in the absence of information rumors abound. That I'm going to have to divert that question over to Gordon because um, I, I got word on Wednesday morning while I was on the Pike Road fire that a notice was issued so we left that fire to go down. By the time I could get things set up at our main station for an evacuation, word came back to us that it was not for Slab Creek. Slab Creek had never been in that. Um, but the communication right now, the way it's set up was going through um, our emergency manager. So, um, that is something that I'm gonna be trying to work with Gordon on so that we can address that, um, those and solve those rumor problems. And if we have something, we get the word out the right way, not just hearsay. 
Okay, thank you, Jim. Gordon, did you want to add to, add to that? Sure, I can shed a little light on it. As I said before, um, I called Lincoln County and tried to get information. I called down to the fire and couldn't get them either, but I highly suspected that's because everybody was out fighting the fire. Um, the reason we didn't send out any alerts is the alerts that we were sending is to notify people of a change in level and there were no changes of level in South County. The only area that uh, we changed levels on was a result of the Pike Street fire. So we were busy drafting up uh, the messages, sending them out via the alert notification system, commonly referred to as reverse 911, but I always caution people that's actually a trademark business. And they have actually called 911 and said, you better stop or we're going to sue you. So it's alert notification system. We did send out as I said before, I gave uh, our other lieutenant that was handling that my passwords and all to Nixle. So he was sending out Nixle as well. But again, the reason you didn't receive an alert was because there was none. And um, again, part of my problem was getting information from Lincoln County. And I have since talked to the, the emergency management director down there and told her it didn't work for me. And she assures me that she's worked with her 911 folks who should have been calling us to let us know what was going on and didn't. Um, so hopefully that won't happen again. And again, the alert notification system is, is uh, Everbridge. And we both are working with Everbridge to push out our boundary from the county line to a half a mile into the other person's county so that um, again what had happened before was when they sent out the alert that included uh, Cascade Ranch it only included Cascade or uh, the area in Lincoln County not anything in Tillamook County um, which she didn't know and of course I didn't know uh, if, if you draw a block and when you hit send, you think it's going to everybody in that block, but it's only going to go to the everybody in that block that's in your county, unless they've registered uh, on that system as well. So um, if you go to Lincoln County's Everbridge page or, or alert notification page and, and act like your house phone is your cell phone and tell them what the address is, you will now get the alert. Uh, which you did not get before if we had sent one. No Thank good. you. Rand, do you want to take the next question? You have to unmute. Rand, unmute yourself. Good. Okay, there we go. Um, well, I will jump in with a detail about the Slab Creek situation because uh, we were in it that, that is a question. So I apologize for jumping in and asking my own question. Uh, Slab Creek Valley did not have cell phones working or power. So the only way of communicating with anyone would have been door to door. And actually our neighbor Gail went down to the fire station, did communicate with that crew and they would have come uh, up the valley with their sirens and going door to door if, their, if the alert level would have changed. So the most local of situations with the, the fire hall crew and, and Gail, who is uh, an ex-volunteer fire department person from uh, the district, we facilitated that communication and since the alert never changed levels, uh, there was no door-to-door -door evacuation by the people who lived in the valley. But we will be working <laughs> with you, uh, Marge, to work out more captains and more ways and more radios up here that don't require cell towers or electricity in order to, uh, now that we're aware of uh, how alone we can be up here. Uh, so that I just wanted to address that 
uh, because that's what I know about that situation. Uh, Chris, you want to take next question? Sure. This is for uh, Sarah. Uh, is there any discussion in the Department of Community Development about requiring seismic shutoff valves for propane tanks? Thank you. Uh, so um, the short answer is I'm not entirely sure, but this is a great question and something that I'm going to look into um, with the experts in the building division of community development. Uh, one thing that is probably important to note is that um, we are getting ready to go through a series of code amendments and updates so that our county codes are consistent with the international building codes. And so there may be some room for discussion in that area as well. So more to come. Thank you for the question. And I will report back with an answer to Brenda that she can share in the next couple of days when I know. All right. Um, this, we have a question from Roger Averbeck. Please discuss the tsunami warning system in the event of a distant earthquake not felt by Tillamook County residents. Some residents and most visitors may not receive TCEM notifications. That's an easy one. Um, uh, again, she said distant. So it, obviously if it was local, you would have felt the ground shaking for almost five minutes. And that is your warning. For distant, um, you may recall way back when we had tsunami sirens, we did some investigating into their locations and if they were, uh, uh, were in the right spots and it, how many we needed and all that. And during that process is when Dagami came out with the new uh, inundation maps. And we discovered that a distant tsunami is actually about to the level of an astronomical high tide event. And so there's very few structures or people that are in danger other than the people directly on the beach. And one of the things I did do or was able to accomplish is I got a state Homeland Security grant that purchased some very expensive but very effective speakers that I provided to the Civil Air Patrol and one is in, I believe, Salem, and one is down south, um, Coos Bay or someplace south of there in airplanes. And if we had to, we could have them fly the coast within a four hour period, which is the minimum time that you would need to notify people on the beach um, that there is a danger of a wave coming and to take action. If you recall the, the last, incident we had was the J Japanese uh, earthquake back in 2011, and it gave us a two centimeter wave. Um, kind of hard to, to see a two centimeter wave when you've got 12, 14 foot seas already. Um, so outside of that, we also discovered during that 2011 event that within that four hour period, we can actually have people knocking on doors of the people that are affected. Um, and, and still accomplish all that again within the four hour time frame. So you you wouldn't need to worry about not being having a cell phone or being a visitor or whatever, you would get the information. Thank you. If, if I can jump in real quick on that too. Um, and, and it kind of goes back to up on Slab Creek with the fire also, um, we would, that's where we had at that time we didn't have the cert members but when the the tsunami was coming we went door to door in all of our district we split our crews up and anybody we hit all the homes where people were even those to make sure they weren't we'd be doing that with the fires also if we had to do that evacuation with with the cert teams that we have now that will give us even more people that will be able to get out and do that door to door knocking and advise people whether it's a fire tsunami whether it's some other kind of a windstorm we'll be able to have those people out on the ground and it will be able to expedite that even more now okay thank you i 
We got a question from Phil Schmidt. It was beachfront homeowners cover the cost of riprap, but other homes receive value from the expense. Is there a view of community involvement when riprap is damaged that uh, the county has or from emergency uh, preparedness about uh, repairs for riprap uh, in the future? Um, so Randall, I'll probably start this uh, because um, riprap is primarily permitted through the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, community development does have a moderate level of regulatory review and responsibility. And typically that is twofold. That will be um, with FEMA uh, flood compliance, but then also confirming eligibility for both new and repair riprap construction. Um, it is my understanding that OPRD has typically uh, required the cost of those construction projects to be uh, the responsibility of the homeowners or the entities that are requesting the riprap construction. If I can weigh in on that also just a bit from the county's perspective, Armoring beaches is great for the homeowners that are that have the ability to, to put up riprap and armor their armor their homes. But we all need to understand that that just moves the, the force of the waves uh, in different directions and oftentimes creates an even bigger hazard for neighboring um, um, residences. So yeah, Sarah is absolutely correct. Um, homeowner, if, if you are grandfathered in and are able to have riprap in front of your home to protect your, your beachfront home, um, you are responsible for that. Uh, in, in the future, uh, armoring beaches is not, going, is not going to get any easier. It's gonna become more and more difficult as we move forward in time. Great, thanks. A um, couple questions for David Helmrichs. Um, the, the first one I think is fairly um, straightforward. It's whether metal roofs will help prevent structural uh, fires in rural forested areas. It does help um, with preventing the structure catching on fire. There's different uh, materials that help, but metal is one of the top on the list. Okay, great. Uh, and the next question is, what's the best way to contact you and, and your office to coordinate a site visit? Uh, I will put my info uh, contact uh, desk phone number in the comments. So if, if people want, I, they can write it down from there. And, I, and Brenda Frisch, Freshman has it as well. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, does the county utilize... IPAWS, the FEMA Integrated Public Alert and Warning System to communicate emergency notifications. That was from Michael Boyle. Yes, we do. That system, what it does is it, um, it goes directly to a tower and then the tower sends it out to every cell phone within receiving distance of that cell phone tower. Um, the, the difference between that and the Everbridge is with Everbridge, we can draw a block and only hit the homes that we want to hit vice every cell phone within that distance. Um, the the uh, obvious other problem that we have here in Tillamook County is what I affectionately call the no phone zones. So there's a lot of areas that the cell phone doesn't reach and um, I guess in that case, you wouldn't get it either way. So, um, you know, again, the, the it's a good system uh, on paper, but it, again, it's going to send it to every cell phone in, in the reception of it. it. There's no way to isolate it or direct it only to the people that need it. So, for example, if we had sent out an evacuation notice, everybody that received it would have ended up evacuating vice using our alert system that we have, we can identify exactly who to, to who to notify. But I do have it. So 
So from Marie Long, why were all the radios, local radio stations off? And is there a system for radio stations to communicate during emergencies? And maybe this would be a time to let people know about those radios that have initials in front of them. I don't remember that everyone should be getting so that they tune into your um, emergency network and whoever can take that. Are they talking radio stations or radios in general? It says local radios. Why were all the local radios off? So I don't know if that, and, and is there a system for radio stations to communicate during emergencies? So it's probably radio stations. Let me just point out that most of the radio stations these days, the music and everything you hear is streamed in and frequently there's nobody there. Um, KTIL has somebody there during normal working hours and from, well, I say that from about eight o'clock until sometime in the afternoon. Um, this fire happened at night and on a holiday. So there was nobody even at the station. We send them the information and I tell people all the time that we send them the information, but we can't make them pump it out. So um, I do know that I had talked to KMUN um, in the evening and they said they were putting out everything that we were putting out they were putting out on the local repeater here in uh, off of Cape Mears um, and I suspect that again in Lincoln County it's similar where at nighttime the music or information that you get is streamed in so that's why you didn't hear it on the radio they weren't at the station we, we text message um, KTIL, um, I'll text message them and they follow our Facebook too. So they'll share stuff on the radio if they can also. Sorry, just thought I'd jump in with that. <laughs> and one of the problems we have in South County is that most people can get zero radio stations in South County. Civic City, I, I, there's not a single station that I can get. So it's, it's a problem with, if you're looking for local radio stations. Well, and I, I think that one of the changes that has happened is that social media ends up being a place where people go and that can be the rumor central that is not informed necessarily unless uh, maybe the emergency element um, utilizes that in some way. Uh, and so it, it can be problematic, but it also can be effective uh, depending on <laughs> how coordinated that is or, or uh, uncoordinated it is. Yeah, as fast people as that want to use social media, I, I would tell them, you know, just if, if, if you want, if you want real news, go to the sheriff's office, go to the emergency management uh, webpage uh, on Facebook. At least you'll you'll get real information there. Yeah, right. as fast as we were pumping it out on uh, the sheriff's office Facebook page, of course, there's other streams going on other or other threads going in other areas, and that's where the rumor control would start. Way over there, when all you had to do goes to sheriff's office and get the facts. So, Rand, you asked a question about the GMRS radios. So the GMRS radio information is on the EVC's website, which is www.southcountyevc.org. And you'll find information about the GMRS radios, uh, where to order, et cetera, et cetera. So again, www.southcountyevc.org. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, next question is, uh, what's the probability of getting additional public safety officers in South Tillamook for the spring summer of 2021? And how can this be achieved if at all possible? Well, and actually, and I, I think I mentioned this earlier that uh, our, the new parking fees that will start in January, uh, one of the reasons for doing that is to, is to gain additional sheriff's deputies uh, in, in Tillamook County. And right now, the way we're looking at it is that we hope to be able to hire two additional deputies for Sheriff Horton, uh, getting them up to speed by next summer may be a little problematical, 
Um, but everyone needs to understand that we have found what I think is, is a good funding stream for additional deputies. And uh, I'll let Sheriff Horton um, add whatever he needs to here. Yeah, I agree with the commissioner. It does take about a year from the time we, we identify a candidate, uh, put them through the testing, which includes medical, psychological, uh, a 16 week academy, which is going to be extended to 22 weeks at some point. Um, you know, there's funding at the state level and at problems. Um, so they've canceled several academy classes. So getting the basic training for our deputies um, in, in good times is about a year. And um, that's tough. The hope would be is that we could fill these positions with um, lateral transfers. We've been very successful in our efforts to recruit um, lateral transfers to our office. We, we've, we have five state troopers that we've recruited from the Oregon State Police. And that's, that's a huge fee. That's a huge success for us because um, the Oregon State Poli Police pays um, a much higher wage in the sheriff's office. It really speaks to our, our philosophy, our management style, um, the, the high morale we have in our office, the good working environment. Um, we've attracted these lateral transfers. So there's five state troopers and there's one transfer recently from the Tillamook City Police. So people are wanting to come to work for our office. Um, it's just um, when it comes to a new recruit, someone with, that, that does not possess those basic certifications, it takes quite a bit of time. My hope would be to fill these positions with um, existing staff and move some of the, the less critical positions, um, open those up for recruits, entry level folks. Um, we, we believe that we can move some staff around and, and take care of this right away. You know, the majority of the calls for service come out of South County. And so we see that as a priority and, and we'll make as many adjustments as we can to try to get the staff down there. But having approval for one, right away and I, you know, Commissioner Yamamoto is, is working very hard on this. Commissioner Bartline um, is exploring, you know, some funding, um, trying to trying to get uh, legislation to change the, the TLT funds to be channeled to public safety. That, that's a heavy lift, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I know we're in good hands with the commissioners we have and, and they're working hard for us. And um, I think we can make some adjustments and get, get people down there in, in these critical areas, but there, there is no, no magic wand we can wave over this. We're, we're going to make adjustments and do the best we can. And, and believe me, we're, we're listening to everybody and we see where we need additional personnel. But uh, give us time. We'll, we'll, we'll get it done. Thank you. Chris, I, th I think that's all the questions that I see posted, unless I'm missing something. Uh, there's there's um, one regarding the tsunami warning system in, in the event of a distant earthquake not felt by Tillamook County residences. We did um, that. So, some residents and most visitors may not receive TCEM notifications. Yeah, I believe we did, we did ask that question already. Okay. I think that's it. Wait, it looks like there's one more. Isn't there one from someone named Brandon? Do you guys see that? Current, with the current climate, people are asking more of our local police. With that in mind, it seems the wages for our deputies are below the market average for departments of similar size and scope, which obviously affects the ability to attract talented candidates. Has there been any discussion of discussing wages uh, or only adding a head count? But I, I think we have addressed that in a number of the comments, is that not true? I, I we, we have, and, and I can speak a little more to that. So th this comes up all the time, you know, wage is directly connected to recruitment. And again, we can't offer the, the same wage package as someone at, with the Oregon State Police. But, you know, what we can offer is a very positive working environment, support from administration, things that are, that are recruiting these lateral transfers to our office. Um, like I said, it's, it's a big accomplishment to attract people from another agency who make a higher wage to come to our agency and make effectively a lower wage. What we have, what we're, we're constrained by is the ability to, to compare to other counties. Um, per statute, we can only compare to other counties in terms of wage and compensation to similar counties of population size. So we directly compare to Wasco County or to Curry County or Jefferson County. Counties in terms of population that are very similar, 
but but have vastly different needs and 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 impacts to their 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 local economy and their their infrastructure. Um, Wasco County does not have the tourist you know visitation levels that Tillamook County has. So you know we're 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 you know inhibited by some of those rules. Um, I've stood up many times that we we need to pay our staff a higher wage. They have a very difficult job. They they are working very hard and they should be compensated accordingly. But that's again, sometimes the economics local economics don't lend itself to that. But we're we're trying to find solutions to it. And again, uh, the commissioners um, they they see this. They they understand the need for public safety and, and appropriate compensation. And there again, there's no there's no simple answer. But but we are trying to explore options. But again, we go back to being limited to what we can and can't do per statute. And uh, that, that's a huge discussion that, that we have every time we negotiate a contract. Um, unfortunately, the, where, we, where we measure up currently, Tillamook County is within the wage market. So according to the comp and class studies, we're paying our deputies what they should be making, but I would, I would submit that it's not enough. Yeah, and that's probably true. People need to understand that the biggest general fund department that the county has is the sheriff's office. And our funding is extremely limited. Uh, if you look at the state budget right now, it is in shambles. Um, they are projecting red ink, not only this year, but for the next two biennium. They're, they're, they're just overflowing in red ink. Uh, we don't know yet what our budget holds for us, but we're, we're not expecting any large increases. Uh, and I think the sheriff's office really needs to be commended here because it wasn't that long ago. And Jim, I know you remember this, uh, that we were losing sheriff's deputies to the Oregon State Patrol on a regular basis. I mean, they would, they would be hired, they would be trained by the, the Tillamook County Sheriff's Office. And once they were trained up, guess what? They went to OSP. Now things are turned around and it, it's because of the working atmosphere, I think, more than anything else. It's certainly not because of the money. Um, so that's definitely working in our favor. Uh, where we come up with more money uh, to pay our deputies what they are, what we really should be paying them is a whole different discussion. Okay, are there, are there any more questions? Okay, if they haven't, then why don't um, Sarah, why don't, we'll ask Sarah, our moderator, to make some few closing comments mm -hmm. and uh, we'll wrap it up. Take it away, Thank Sarah. you. Could I step in just real quick? I want to sure. talk a little bit more on what uh, Sheriff Horton had mentioned. Commissioner Bartline has prepared legislation going into the 21 session. One of the things he's asked all of the department heads throughout the fire agencies and everything is to help promote this bill, which will try to change TLT uh, legislation that says you can only spend the money in a, these certain areas. Um, we're going to be making a very big push um, once this gets assigned a bill number. We're going to, I know at least for down in South County, I'm going to be asking for letters of support from the community associations and all over. I've already had discussions throughout the state on this. We've got some good support already started, but where we have to really fight, and it's going to be the hardest part of this fight, is we're going to have to fight the tourist industry. They don't want any of this money going away that they use for their advertising. So that's going to be a big Big push if we can get this through for the sheriff's office, for the fire districts. Um, it will give us some money to help take care of some things that we just can't do right now because of funding. Good to hear that. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much, sir. Do you have any closing comments um, just so we can wrap this up? and? If you do have any final questions, you can try to get them in. Remember, we will give them to the panelists. This isn't our last thing. Um, I'm, a, but sorry, I wanted you to. I wanted you to say your thing before I said that. So you go. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. 
So um, one of the things that I would like um, to leave everyone with this evening is the experts that have been um, speaking this evening uh, as part of our panel. When community development looks at future development or we look at um, ways that we can strengthen our ordinances for risk reduction and hazard mitigation, all of the people that, you've, uh, that we've heard from this evening are people that become part of that conversation. Um, Chief Ader and I, for instance, when it comes to applications that you will regularly see that we review and uh, make decisions on, Chief Ader is an instrumental part and plays a very critical role in development review, uh, specifically for fire and life safety and to look at risk reduction and hazard mitigation. And our relationship is we will work through those permitting review process together and also as construction's happening on the ground. And the reason why we do that is because again, if there's an issue later or a hazard or some sort of event, we work hard together to make sure that whatever damage could happen to life and property involved with that development is minimized to the best of our abilities. It also helps us move forward with recovery efforts. And when we start talking about recovery efforts or future regulation, uh, Marge Josa, Sheriff Horton, the county commissioners, and even PUD, they become part of that conversation. Wildfire risk is something that's really come to the forefront of conversations. Around 10 years ago, uh, Ed Walmart, who also works for the Department of Forestry and I, went around to each community and actually talked about resiliency and wildfire protection by way of explaining why constructing fuel bricks were important. Um, we had landscaping manuals that the Department of Forestry puts out that talk about fire resistant landscaping uh, vegetation options. So you can still have a nice yard, but um, you're reducing at the same time, you're reducing the, the risk of wildfire. And some of the regulations that we see today that you may or may not be aware of is if people uh, have the ability to construct a home in a forest zoned area, which is much of the area that is east of your community boundary, or if they are building uh, a home within 100 feet of a forest zoned area, there are currently requirements in place that they follow the Oregon Department of Forestry wildfire protection standards for fuel breaks, and that we make development requirements that they have to construct their homes with fire resistant materials. So that is your spark arrester that is your fire resistant materials for your roof and your siding. And so there's a lot of things that you may or may not be aware of that we're actually doing that we have implemented. We certainly have a long way to go. And as these risks become more prevalent in our communities and threaten our communities, these are conversations that we will continue to have as a county and with our communities. And so, um, you know, if you have any questions, if you'd like to know more about current regulations that are in place, please don't hesitate to reach out and email me. Um, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. And I wanna thank everyone uh, for attending here. Oh, this is um, just the second in probably many, maybe 12 to 15 more informational town halls we will be having. We plan to have one at least once a month or about once a month for the next 18 to 24 months. So tune in. Um, this will also be posted to the Nesquin Community YouTube channel. And um, I will then conclude my comments. I will, except I wanna thank my colleagues, Rand and Chris for joining me for all these adventures and thank Sarah and every single panelist and all the attendees. Rand or Chris, do you have anything to say or tell the, to the attendees before we sign off? Uh, I don't, but I'll, I'll share with uh, you, Brenda, the uh, recording, the link to the recording, and you can post that. Will do. Will do. Right. And, and I hope everyone can stay tuned and make it to the next event. We're going to be doing a monthly, and we will uh, put this to the NCA website. And soon we will have an NCAC website, and we'll work with the uh, community association uh, to migrate the information that have, they've housed for decades over onto the NCA website, which will um, we'll be trying to get that up in the next six weeks so that it's uh, functional and you can uh, uh, go there for information and for all the uh, scheduling of the upcoming uh, 
informational town halls, as well as our regular meetings. So thank you all for taking the time to attend this evening. All right, thank you and good night.